Several months back, Artillery 3D hooked me up with their Sidewinder X2, and the timing couldn't have been better. I was in the middle of designing a prototype enclosure and needed a 3D printer with some serious capacity. The SWX2 delivered, knocking out large components at impressive speeds. But after clocking in around 100 hours, it hit a snag. The filament started binding up, leading to some major under extrusion. I took it apart, diagnosed the issue, fixed it up, and since then, a solid thousand hours of flawless printing. So the big question, is the Sidewinder X2 the ultimate bang for your buck large format 3D printer out there? Well, let's go back to the beginning to find out. Hey guys, CJ here from Elevated Systems. Before diving into today's review, a quick personal update. Some of you might have caught my recent community post where I mentioned undergoing surgery. To keep it brief, I had my gallbladder removed due to chronic issues. I met with a surgeon on a Monday and boom, surgery three days later. It wasn't an emergency, but definitely last minute. There were a few hiccups given the size of the gallbladder and its impact on its surroundings. And about 11 days later, I ended up back in the hospital due to some further complications, including a partially collapsed lung, which have set back my recovery time, but fingers crossed in about six to eight weeks, I should be back to 100%. A huge thanks to all of you for the kind words and support. Now, while I'm on the mend, I'll still try to push out content like today's review, but bear with me, the usual top tier production quality might take a slight hit. Moving around isn't easy right now, so setting up those dynamic B-roll shots isn't gonna happen. For now, it's either sitting or standing, and it takes time to go from one to the other. So today I'll be sitting here sharing my thoughts on the it Artillery Sidewinder X2 using whatever footage I've already gathered over the past few months. So let's get into it. And I'll start where I started, unboxing and assembling this machine, which was super simple. The printer comes in essentially two pieces, the base and the gantry. So you simply line up the gantry legs and tighten the capture screws from the bottom. A neat feature of this printer is all the X and Y and print head control is handled through a solid PCP connection built directly into the gantry. So almost everything is plugged in once you screw the two pieces together. All that's left is to quickly assemble and attach the spool holder and plug in the sensors and Z-axis motor. All right, before we dive into the setup and initial print, let's break down the features of this 3D printer. First off, it's packed with some standout features. We're talking about a Titan style direct extruder paired with a volcano style nozzle. This combo allows the machine to lay down material super fast. Then there's the dual Z axis with a double lead screw and synchronized by a belt at the top rail and held together with a robust metal and brass coupling system. Dual Z axis motors is the gold standard for vertical movement of the gantry arm. It's a significant step up from the single lead screw and V roller system which can lead to uneven travel over time. I've clocked in nearly a thousand hours on this and the gantry arm has stayed perfectly aligned. Now the bed, the standout feature for many will be its size, a solid 300 by 300 millimeters. Pair that with the 400 millimeters of vertical travel and you've got a massive build volume. The bed itself, a textured tempered glass panel directly attached to an AC powered heating element. Let's unpack that. The AC heating is super efficient. For basic PLA prints, it heats up to 60 degrees in less than a minute. And from my tests with a laser thermometer, the temperature variance from the center to the edges was only about five degrees. Safety wise, considering we're dealing with 110 or 220 direct line AC voltage on a moving platform, artillery has taken some steps. The bed cable is sturdy and sits in a recessed track. And instead of the usual setup where you have a heating element attached to a metal bed with the glass panel clipped on, artillery went a different route. They've ditched the metal bed and glued the heating element straight to the glass. This move cuts down on potential shock risks and sheds some weight, which is a win for a bed slinger. But there's a trade-off. If the textured glass panel wears out, you're looking at replacing the whole bed assembly. Alternatively, you could clip on a spring steel or thin glass panel. The glass bed's performance was on point. 
print stuck well during printing and popped off smoothly once cooled. No need for any scraping. Just a heads up though, this bed is very sensitive to dirt, dust, and especially finger oil. So you wanna make sure it's good and clean prior to starting your prints. The SWX2 is powered by Marlin and sports an LCD touchscreen. Navigation through its menus feels natural and it's packed with all the features you would anticipate. But there's a catch, at least on my unit. The touch accuracy seems a bit off. More often than not, when I aim for an icon, the one to its left is the one that gets activated. It's a bit of a pain, especially when I'm trying to fine tune settings mid print. My workaround, using the tip of my pinky and aiming just tad right the center to hit the right spot. Under the hood, the printer boasts a 32-bit mainboard, making it whisper quiet. Stepper motor noise is virtually non-existent. The only time you might catch a hint of it is during high-speed movements, and that's with my travel speed cranked up to 200 to 250 millimeters per second. Finally, let's talk about some of the printer's smart features. First up, it's got a filament runout sensor right on the spool holder. Plus, there's an auto resume function for those unexpected power outages. I put both to the test and they delivered. Here's what happened. I ran out of filament mid print, noticed it probably within the hour. The nozzle cooled down, but the bed stayed warm. I slid a piece of paper between the nozzle and the print to catch the goo, loaded up a fresh spool, hit resume, and it finished the job without a hitch. I also accidentally cut the power during a print. I fired it back up and it seamlessly picked up right where it left off. Just a heads up though, I was quick on the restart so the machine was still warm. If there's a longer power outage, bed cooling might be an issue to consider. Well, that's most of the features, so let's break down the setup and the first print experience. Right out of the box after assembling, everything was on point. The V-rollers belts perfectly tensioned, didn't have to tweak anything. This combined with the fact that I noticed a bit of black filament extruding when I first loaded my gray PLA, tells me the printer underwent some quality control and testing before it got to me. All that was left was bed leveling. The SWX2 has a spring tensioned bed with adjustment knobs and a BL touch style auto leveling system. My approach with machines like this is always a three step bed leveling process. Step one, heat the bed, grab a folded sheet of standard printer paper and use those knobs to manually level it. The built-in menu has a manual level mode that lets you pick each corner and get things level in no time. Then I hit up the auto level function. After that's done, I'm back with the paper to set the Z offset. And if you're looking to fine tune, you can micro adjust the Z offset during a print to get that first layer height just right. And there you have it. With this method, I've clocked in hundreds of print hours without ever needing to touch the bed level again, unless I physically move the printer to a new location. I just power it up, hit print, and watch that first layer go down flawlessly every single time. As for print quality, speed, and accuracy, they've all been impeccable. Starting with speed, here's a look at the settings I use in Cura for most of the prints I've done on the SWX2. This is quite fast for a 300 millimeter bed slinger. It's allowed me to print components like this in approximately 12 to 18 hours. This is with a 0.2 millimeter layer height and using a 0.4 millimeter nozzle. The quality has been excellent. There's some ghosting around holes and text, but there's no layer shifting, stringing, or over extrusion. The layer lines are visible, but that's mostly dependent on the filament used. I primarily use Sunlu PLA Plus because it's affordable and performs well across all my printers. However, it does leave some distinct layer lines. When I use the pricier Prusament, all the layer lines were almost invisible on the same part using identical settings. The most crucial aspect for me is the dimensional accuracy of my final print. Another reason I prefer Sunlu PLA Plus as its shrink rate is less than 1%. By using the outside to in wall print option and reducing the outer wall print speed to 80 millimeters per second, every print has consistently met the dimensional tolerances I incorporated into the design. While there are print and place gauges and calibration devices to measure a printer's accuracy, I typically don't spend much time with them unless I encounter issues. I tend to rely on real re results. If everything fits, slides, and snaps together as I intended, 
I consider it a success. Everything I've printed on this printer has met that standard. Now, the original plan for this video was to stage the SWX2 on my workbench with all the prints I've done on it piled up. However, I just can't physically do that right now. Plus, it'd be a bit boring as I use FDM printers almost exclusively for practical printing. In fact, over half the print time on this machine is various iterations of this enclosure and refining a version of my CJ64 keyboard enclosure. I've done other stuff too, made some hefty replacement feet for my wife's treadmill that I kind of broke while moving it, printed new enclosures from some speakers that had a run-in with water, blade guards for my table saw, parts for my table router, and some handy things for my garage organization. Most of my designs are pretty straightforward and square, with the exception of this dice tower I printed for my daughter. Now, for this print, which was more detailed, I did drop each speed parameter by about 20 millimeters per second, which is about exactly what I can print on something like my Ender 3 with the same level of final quality, which is pretty much perfect. The difference is I was able to fit all six components on the SWX2 build plate and get the project done in a single print. But this does point out one of the limitations of my review of this machine. While this printer seems like a great machine for larger scale, more detailed projects like say cosplay, armor, and weaponry, or any large scale or multi-component print project, that isn't something I typically test on FDM printers, especially with the plethora of more affordable, larger scale resin printers entering the market. But there have been some other limitations to my testing. I've exclusively been printing with PLA or PETG, and they've been rock solid without needing an enclosure. But if you're thinking of a DIY enclosure for a printer this size, it might hit the wallet a bit. So for those more advanced materials like ABS, ASA, nylon, polycarbonate, or composites that need an enclosure, this might not be your first choice. Now, where I might have missed the mark with this printer is sticking to the stock 0.04 millimeter nozzle because I wanted that pinpoint accuracy. But with its Titan extruder and the zippy print speeds, it's screaming for those beefier 0.6 to 0.8 millimeter volcano nozzles. If you're going big but don't need super tight tolerances, these larger nozzles could be just the ticket. I'm thinking 0.6 to 0.8 millimeters, it's where it's at, giving you that sweet mix of speed and solid print quality. But if you're thinking even bigger, like one millimeter or more, you might have to slow down the speeds considerably or give that cooling fan an upgrade to keep those layers nice and crisp and not goopy. Now, I do need to test those larger nozzles, and I do have some print projects that are less technical and more just for fun, so I'll make community posts on those results, so be sure to get subscribed so you don't miss those. All right, before we close this out, there are a couple of issues with the printer I've got to address. I touched on these in the previous video. First up, the probe on the BL Touch Auto Leveler took a hit. Not entirely sure how it went down, but my best guess, it extended mid-print somehow and collided with the print, bending the probe. This messed up the Z height the next time I set it to Z home, causing the nozzle to crash into the bed on my subsequent print. Thankfully, a quick manual Z offset adjustment got things back on track, and shout out to customer support. One email, and they had a replacement part on the way. But here's the bigger issue. After clocking in about 100 hours, the printer just gave out. I was seeing major under extrusion, the filament was getting stuck, and the extruder gear was grinding away without pushing the filament through the hot end. After breaking down the print head assembly, I found the culprit. The guide tube's end was melted. This tube is critical. It guides the filament, keeps it straight, and insulates it from the hot end, ensuring it only melts when it hits the nozzle. Typically, these tubes are made of PTFE, which can handle temps up to 320 degrees Celsius. Given that my nozzle never went above 250, I'm thinking the tube wasn't PTFE, maybe nylon, not entirely sure. I've mostly seen PTFE tubing in white or blue, never black. Anyway, swapped it out with some PTFE tubing I had lying around, and it's been smooth sailing since. And after some research, unlike the issue with the touchscreen, I couldn't find any other examples of customers having this issue, so it's possible it was just a fluke. All right, let's break it down. Despite a few hiccups when you factor in its speed, direct drive, extruder, volcano hot end, quick print times, whisper quiet operation, and responsive customer support, this printer stands out 
sure, there are bigger options out there like the popular Anycubic Cobra Max, but when you stack it up against the SWX2, it's noticeably slower, louder, and more expensive. The Sidewinder X2, it's in the same league as the Creality CR10, but here's the kicker. Once you kit out the CR10 with features that match the Sidewinder, you're staring at a price tag nearing $500. Meanwhile, the SWX2 is currently going for just around $300. That competitive price combined with its features position it as one of the best large format FDM printers on the market. So there you have it. If you're in the market for a large format 3D printer that delivers on performance without breaking the bank, the SWX2 is a solid contender. It's all about getting the most bang for your buck and this printer checks a lot of the boxes. As always, thanks for tuning in. If you found this review helpful, drop a like and don't forget to subscribe for more tech insights and I'll catch you in the next one.